Nugget. Oh, there she is. Nugget. About what? Four pounds? Uh, I think she's like five after she got steak. Five after she eats. Okay, yeah. Nugget. Very good. Okay, that's good. Okay, we have a jam-packed day today. We have nine people going to come up, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to run them through very fast, kind of, in a sense. Then we have a test on Wednesday. You're going to meet us in uh, G126 on Wednesday. I think the room is available like the hour before the test. I think it has been in the past. I'll double check, but I'm pretty sure it is. So today I have nine people, and there's nine clicks under the photo period uh, links, the reading links, and everybody, all these nine people got assigned to summarize the uh, one of the links. And so I've got stuff up here, but I wanted to show everybody on this laser pointer instead of showing everybody individually. If you're coming up here today, I know it's a little hard, but on this thing, and it's a little hard to see, but see a little green arrow above the two arrows here? This is the, <laughs> this is the thing that does the, uh, that little line of green right there. Press that, and that's the laser pointer. It's kind of a neat laser pointer. It's got a timer on it. If you ever, if you ever become a professional, now you're making a liar out of me. Uh oh, my battery just might have went out. <laughs> That's just what I don't need. Okay, the laser pointer just died. <laughs> oh, hold on, let me see. Okay, I don't have any spare batteries. Forget that. Let's see. You use this pencil. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I was going to brag on the laser pointer. Let me tell you, it's not going to work. But it's got a timer in it, so if you're ever a professional, like trying to impress somebody, and you have to be on time, it's got a little timer, and it'll tell you when to end. You know how it tells you when to end? It vibrates. Think of that. That's kind of neat. It's like you're pointing, and then if you were like at a big sales meeting, and it vibrates, you go, okay, I got a half a minute left. So, but it died. Okay. So, Alexmar, am I saying that right? Yeah. Come on up. I've got your, this is yours, isn't it? Okay, here, sorry. I'm going to start this, and then, who's number two on the links? Who's number two? Come over and stand by the door, because we're gonna like, have a person presenting, and then the next person is gonna be up here, rather than we wait for them to come up. So who's number three? Okay, so then after she comes up, you take her spot. Yeah, we gotta great, we gotta make sure we don't walk on the dog. Okay, so, um, if you need a pointer, use this pencil. That's really disgusting. I should have a battery. Oh, the best laid plans. We're set. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, I have the circadian rhythm, which is also known as the diurnal rhythm. And it's basically any biological process that shows an endogenous, so within, entrainable oscillation of about oh, okay, 24 <laughs> hours. And then this 24 hour period is like regulated by the circadian clock, which is located, if I'm not mispronouncing it, um, the supracosmatic yeah. nucleus. nucleus. Yeah, so it's located there. And then in order for a rhythm to be considered the cir uh, the, a circadian rhythm, it has to meet three criteria. And one of them is that the rhythm has to be endogenous and free running under any um, conditions basically. The second, it has to be entrainable, so it has to reset itself every time. And then the third one would be it has to exhibit temperature compensation, which basically means that it has to be maintained a constant, I mean, a period of 24 hours in any temperature range. So, as we know, biological processes are like they can vary depending on the temperature, so this kind of regulates that at what time. That's why I have this. <coughs> thing right here. Um, it says like a time, oh, I can't see that well. Like at different times in the evening, like biological processes are like optimized or like they go off at a certain time basically. So it's kind of interesting, like look at six o'clock in the evening, urinary flow of the highest. It's yeah. interesting. Okay. So, yeah, so. Um, I had to enlarge that and so it got a little. Bit oh, no, that's yeah. fine. And then some, like in animals, it's used basically like we talked last week about um, long day and short day breeders. So it's basically like animals use this or I guess 
they don't use it. It comes naturally to like regulate when they have to breed or when they don't breed. And then some facts that I saw on the on the link has said that the circadian rhythm can be adaptable <coughs> depending on the environment. So like the blind mole rat, so it basically mm -hmm. lives in darkness. So its circadian rhythm, um, oh, I forgot to say that. Never mind. So its circadian rhythm adapted, so it doesn't need any external stimuli to regulate it. So also um, the circadian rhythm is regulated by, like I said, <coughs> external um, cues that are called um, it's a German word. <laughs> Zeitgeber. No. Zeitgeber. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's they're like time givers. They're like cues from the environment, um, known as time givers. So, yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay, any quick questions? Okay, thank you. Notice how we got that pointer. Yeah, that's <laughs> dangerous. Okay, we're at no, number two, Brianna, and then Andy's going to go over by the door. Sorry about this crude pointer. All the best. I'll have to carry batteries yeah. around. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need. I actually need an assistant. This is yours, right? Yeah. Okay. There okay. we go. So I had melatonin, which we've talked about for like I feel like the last week. Um, but we know it's a hormone, and it's also known as n acetyl 5 methyoxytryptamine um, and it's produced by the pineal gland, which we just talked about. Um, it is made both in animals and plants, which I thought was really interesting. Um, in animals, it's usually used to regulate the sleep and wake cycle, like she just mentioned. Um, so, like she also said, it involves the synchronization of the car... Cardi cardian rhythms that regulate the sleep wake cycle. It also regulates blood pressure and um, seasonal reproduction. Um, and then in plants, which I thought was the most interesting thing I read, it's the first defense against oxidative stress, which I thought was really interesting. Um, it was discovered first in coffee extracts and it is present in both the roots, the leaves, the stalk, every part of the plant. Um, the highest concentrations of this, as far as plants goes, have been found in coffee, tea, wine, and beer. Wow. Um, its main goals, besides the oxidative protection, is also to regulate the growth of the plant and to protect against the environment. So like in the winter, when it's cold, it's going to not make as much, so it's going to be kind of dormant. it. And then in the spring, when it's nice, and it's going to grow more, so it's used in the regulation of that. Um, as far as discovery, it was first discovered in 1917 by Nicord and Allen when they were doing experiments on tadpoles. Um, when given the extract of the cow uh, pineal glands, the tadpole skins actually lightened in color, which was pretty cool. Um, and then in 1958, Lerner, Lerner isolated the drug and hoped that it could be useful in treating skin disease, and he was the one that officially named it melatonin. Uh, medical uses include sleep disorders, jet lag, or jet lag, night shift workers who need that constant change of what is normal, um, gallstones, protection from radiation, and um, they're using it for autism as well. And they've also did a couple of trials on cancer patients, but nothing has been concluded from those yet. Um, there's very few adverse effects that I could find. The most common one was nausea, next day drowsiness, and irritability. Um, but they did mention that in the elderly, it could cause decreased blood flow, which could cause hypothermia. And um, it's also been shown to lower follicle stimulating hormones, which makes sense with the breeding cycle. And then the foods that it's most commonly found in include banana, pineapples, oranges, cherries, grapes, rice, herbs, olive oil, wine, and beer. Amazing. The other thing is, someplace in the reading I know it says, some other tissues besides the pineal gland makes melatonin yeah. in people. And that was the amazing thing, you know. And that's what you always got to be, you know, sometimes we just like constricted too much. Pineal only makes uh, makes melatonin nobody else, but there's other cells in the body that make melatonin. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, anybody, quick questions on that? Okay, thank you. Andy, come on <laughs> up. Let's see, Andy, is this you? Yes, it is. Okay, and then, Emily, if you'll stand over by the door. That. You, don't, you don't need it. It's the only thing I can have. Okay. We're ready. 
All right, well, I had the pineal gland, which we have talked about quite a bit. Um, it is an endocrine gland, and the main thing it does produce is uh, melatonin. Um, now, something about some stuff about it, it is shaped like a pine cone, as we've said multiple times. But it's actually very small. It's about 5 to 8 millimeters, which is about the size of a grain of rice. And it is located near the center of the brain between the two hemispheres. Um, now, as we've said, melatonin, it does kind of modulate the sleep-wake cycle, you know, circadian rhythm and stuff like that. But actually how melatonin is produced is kind of interesting. So the light <laughs> that we see during the day hits the retinas, and this sends a signal to the center or to the anterior of the hypothalamus, and it synchronizes that part of the hypothalamus to the day-night cycle. Then that information gets sent through nerve fibers uh, to the paraventricular nuclei in the brain, which then sends it again to the superior cervical ganglia that, in, that innervates the pineal gland. So it's a series of different signals to and from that eventually does get to the pineal gland and secrete melatonin. Uh, there have been some studies on rodents that have shown that the pineal gland influences uh, or melatonin influences the secretion of uh, sex hormones and FSH and LH as well, which kind of leads to why it's a big factor in different seasonal breeding. And as said before, it was originally believed to be a vestigial remnant of a larger organ, which I found was kind of interesting. You know, they didn't really think it had much purpose. And it was named and really kind of truly discovered by Aaron Lerner of Yale and his colleagues in uh, 1958. Okay, Any, anybody have any questions? Yeah, it's right, you know, I dissected one out of the pineal out of a cow one time. And if you ever do this, it's right on the midline, and you know how the brain has two hemispheres, and you basically could just spread the two hemispheres down, and it's got that, uh, it's the epi, Thelmus, that's the name of the uh, location. Epi means upon or above, on. And so it's like just above the thalamus. And in the cow, it's gonna be a little bigger than like that. And so it's actually big enough that you can see with the naked eye and, and know where it's at, because it's like right on the midline. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're doing great. Uh, let's see. Kelly, go over by the door, because you're next. Is this your, this is yours, Emily, right? Okay, if you need a pointer, use that crew pointer. Don't start yet, I'm gonna do something here. Stop. Okay, Emily, take it away. Okay, so I had the pineal gland and the interaction that it has with fluoride. Um, do I just hit the arrows down here up switch it? Yeah, go. Is that yours too? Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, so I'm not gonna spend very much time on this since he covered it and it's been covered in class, but like he said, um, the pineal gland is located in the center, um, so about right there. Um, and it's going to synthesize and secrete melatonin. Um, so fluoride in the pineal gland um, work hand in hand. Um, this little quote that I have right here is kind of the summary. Um, and it was basically word for word off of the um, website reading. So I had pineal gland too if you guys want to read that. Um, but it says fluoride is likely to cause decreased melatonin production and to have other effects on normal pineal function, which in turn can contribute to a variety of effects in humans. Those effects could be like the sleep loss and um, stuff like that that we're uh, dealing with. Um, the highest, of, highest levels of fluoride are found here. Um, it's a major accumulation target for humans. Um, there's also a calcified part and a soft tissue part of the pineal gland. Um, and the higher levels are found in those calcified tissues. Um, the, there's been many studies, uh, but the one that's really stuck out and the one that was really covered in the um, one that I read was the fact that fluoride has shown a decrease in melatonin, which is leading to an increase in um, maturation in females, um, which also has a higher risk of breast cancer. And that's it. Okay, sorry. Nugget just had a little thing, something in her mouth. Okay, thank you. Yeah, fluoride. And, of course, most cities add fluoride to the water, if you're not familiar with that, right? It's supposed to be a cavity, here we go, uh, preventive. Okay, so then we have Kelly, right? This is yours, Kelly? Yeah. Okay. If you need a pointer, sorry, you've got to use that wood stick there. 
Okay, so I was given an article on the photo period effects of dairy cattle, and it said that numerous studies have confirmed that cattle uh, have their milk yield because of a long day stimulation when they have a photo period of 16 hours of light and eight hours of darkness. Uh, endocrine factors that increase milk yield are unknown, but it's thought that insulin-like growth factors may mediate the galactopoietic response, which is just pertaining to the milk production. Insulin-like growth factors increase, increase in heifers and lactating cows in response to long days. Uh, there is, however, a higher response to short days during a dry period due to the priming effect of the photoperiodic response system. And uh, so overall, this article was basically summing up that insulin-like growth factors is a possible mediator that increases milk yield in response to long day photo period management. And then this kind of shows a summary of a, a bunch of different studies that show that the gray bars are when they're given a regular period of, I think, of eight hours of light. And then, and then when they're managed with the 16 hours of light, their milk yield goes up. That's pretty good convincing data, right? I mean, look at, that's a nice study, or nice studies where they did control. Okay, we are, sorry, we are ready for Samantha, right? I should have had Samantha go by the door. And then Candace, you go over by the door, will you? It just makes for the flow. Samantha, this is yours, isn't it? Yes. Okay. If you need a pointer, sorry. Okay. Okay. My article was on the photo period management of dairy cattle for performance and health. And there is evidence in cows exposed to long days of 16 hours, 16 to 18 hours of light that they produce on average two liters of milk more per cow. And lighting is used in the sheep and poultry industries as well with uh, equine breeders. But in cattle, however, they're not seasonal, but they do respond to photo, photo periods in a reproductive sense. Um, in cows, long days are thought to enhance the return to cyclicity, and especially during winter. However, the reproductive changes are subtle in comparison to lactation changes. And a study was done by Michigan State University in 1978 to support these theories. In this study, there are two sets of cows. One set was being introduced to artificial light of 16 hours of light and eight hours of darkness. And then the other set of cows were introduced to just natural light stimulation. And this study was done between September and March where natural light was at the lowest. And after the first 100 days of postpartum, cows produced two liters of milk more per day per cow than those that were on natural light. And then after those 100 days, the treatments were switched between the two sets of cows, and the data essentially stayed the same between the natural photo periods and then the artificial photo periods. So when they switched, did the cows that got the longer day increase the milk production? Mm -hmm. you're saying? Yes. And then um, this response was due to the hormone secretion when exposed to longer days. As we discussed in like previous classes, um, melatonin was used to track the length of day and this increase which altered the secretion of other hormones. And insulin-like growth factor one, which is IGF-1, increased milk yield. And then bovine somatotropin or BST increase, which also increased milk yield and also stimulated IGF-1. And then, though the longer days stimulated higher milk production, it was also found that shorter days lowered the rates of intramammary infection during the first 10 days of lactation. And the short day cattle also had a reduction in somatic cell count, which is SCC, from the dry off to parturition. And short days also tended to have lower prolactin levels, which is associated to higher amounts of prolactin receptor expression. And this data suggested that short day cattle had a greater resistance to pathogen infection during times when they were immunocompromised. And on the economic side of things, all the data suggested that it was cost effective for all types of dairies, no matter how small, how large, to introduce artificial photo periods to the herds to increase milk production. So it's interesting, it wasn't all positive because the shorter days resulted in lower yes. somatic cell count. So do you know um, 
the SCC stands for somatic cell count. That's in the milk. What are they actually counting? You know, what cells are they counting? Do you know? Uh, I didn't really go into much yeah. detail on that yeah. side of things. Yeah. Okay. But Anybody know what they're referring to? This is in the milk? Because it's kind of like, <coughs> I don't know, that's a bad name for it. Somatic cell count, right? I mean, it could be any body cell, but it's not any body cell. What are they actually quantifying when they do somatic cell count? What cells? Somebody said macrophages, that's close. It's part of the answer. White blood cells. They're really quantifying leukocytes, white blood cells in the milk, and it's an indication of the quality of the milk. As somatic cell count goes up, quality of the milk goes down. So then when you have reduced somatic cell count, then that means the quality of the milk is better, and you actually get paid more if you get if you have very low somatic cell count. Then the other thing on this uh, slide is, does everybody know where prolactin is coming from? What gland makes prolactin? Um, could be on the test. You know what gland makes prolactin? The Not the hypothalamus. You're close. <laughs> Anterior pituitary gland. And then, what gland makes insulin-like growth factor? Sometimes it's called IGF-1, one in this case. Sometimes there's number two. Sometimes you call them insulin-like growth factors. Where are they coming from? What's that? The guess was posterior pituitary? No. But, you know, it's a good thing to get it out and say, no, it's not insulin-like growth factor from the posterior pituitary. The kidney or liver? Liver. Okay. And why does the liver make insulin-like growth factor? What causes the liver to do this? And the answer is somatotropin, growth hormone. Growth hormone comes from the anterior pituitary, goes to the liver, and the liver makes insulin-like growth factor when growth hormone comes to the liver. A little endocrinology, which we you know, can't deny. OK, thank you. Excellent. Okay, Joe's going to be up by the door, and I'm going to I'll just start the page, okay? No, that's no, that's no problem. Not a problem. Just so we have something showing. Okay, here we are, and number seven. Candice is going to do number seven, and then before you start, I'm going to shut up my camera. That's a big fold, nursing. Time to wean, right there. That's time to wean. <laughs> we'll just, can I just show this right there? Okay, hold on, no, don't start yet. <laughs> that colt is too big. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, so I have how light signals the breeding season to the mare. And over millennia, organisms that were more in tune with the changing cycles of light and dark of their environment were more likely to survive and reproduce. So through evolution, an internal timing, and timing system evolved to provide organization to biological timing. Two of the most important biological rhythms of mammals are the daily rhythms, which is the circadian, which is 24 hours, and the annual rhythms, which are called circoannual and are about 365 days. Throughout evolution, the young of prey uh, the young of prey animals had a better chance of surviving if they were born during the longer and milder days of spring. The warm spring days provided new grass with more nutrition for the mares uh, with the high energy needs. And the circa annual seasonality of breeding behavior for many mammalian species is actually a timer for birthing rather than breeding. The reproductively active period of seasonal <coughs> breeding animals occurs one gestation length before the optimal time for offspring to be born. For mares, an 11-month 11 11 gestation, which is about 335 days, means mares are long-day breeders with peak fertility during summer months, so offspring is born in the spring. Um, for the horse, melatonin is produced primarily during the hours of darkness and is inhibited by light, and this provides the horse with a means of translating the seasonal changes in day length into a hormonal signal that can regulate the reproductive system. When there is a long duration of melatonin, which is like long winter nights, 
Um, it prevents the release of the hormone gonadotropin, which leaves the mare's ovaries small, hard, and inactive. And um, they also were talking about um, when horse breeding, horse racing became really popular, they decided to give all horses um, a single birthday, which was January 1st. But um, the horses during that time have the inactive ovaries, so we have been using artificial light to, in the northern hemisphere to replicate the having longer days. So they usually use about 16 hours of light. Okay, you said 16 hours of light. Yeah, for right, artificial. For, yeah, the artificial. You know, I always thought when they did that for horses, I always envisioned them doing like maybe 12 hours and then the next week 12 and a half, you know, like grading up to 16. But they just go 16 and then 8. Six, there's no like stepwise progression. And then you said the uh, non-breeding season, the ovaries are hard and did you say static? Uh, I said small and inactive. Yeah, and sometimes you call any ovary that's not working, you call it a static ovary, S-T-A-T-I-C. Uh, there's There might be some small follicles, but they're not growing and ovulating at all. And then um, she said the gestation length of horses is 333 days, about 11 months. And what's amazing about horses, it's quite variable. You can have some horses go 365 days, you can have some like 300 days. Anybody can back me up on that? Anybody have personal experience? Um, one of my mom's friends reached on her more bloods and she has a mare and so like 355 days. Right 355 now. days, so that's very close. Yeah, so of all the domestic animals, like swine don't do that with a wide, uh, wide variety. They're like 114 days. Horses, it's like weeks of variation there, so it's a very amazing thing. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we're doing great, and Joe, and then Kirsten is by the door. Let's see, let's see, Joe, make sure I got yours here. Is that yours? I have two pictures. Yep. Oops, oh, one. Uh, maybe the other one's on the article. Okay, so maybe you can just do one. Yep. Okay, if you need a pointer, here's the crude pointer, sorry. Okay, so I looked at sheep and how um, photo periods affect them. Uh, sheep are short day breeders. Um, and so during the fall slash winter, uh, so October, November is when sheep are ideally bred, uh, you have a decrease in light, which causes a decreased firing of the retinal nerves, which causes a decrease in excitation from the superior cervical ganglion, which then causes the decrease in inhibition of the pineal, uh, pineal gland, um, which is able to re like regulate the changes um, in daylight. And then that increases melatonin secretion, um, and then the increases, increases GNRH, which also increases the FSH and LH. Um, there's another, and then this picture up here pr pretty much shows, the, starts from the eye, and then if you follow the track all the way around, it shows what's released and what's not. Um, there's another picture, if we can find it, that shows what happens during the... Um, yeah, sorry, I thought I had the other oh, that's picture. Okay. But that's, yeah, you, you, you got it great. This is so. This picture then talks about anestrus. So this is when <coughs> sheep are not, um, you know, active for cycling. Uh, this is when there's long photo period. So spring and summer, uh, you have an increase in light, which causes an increased firing of the retinal nerves, which causes an increased uh, excitation from the superior cervical ganglion, which causes an increased inhibition of the pineal gland. But then the change here is that it decreases melatonin secretion, which then is going to decrease GnRH and not produce FSH or LH. So then sheep won't be able to conceive. And then it also talked about pretty much everything else we talked about, which what the pineal gland is and all that, but I won't go into that. Mm -hmm. So Now, I, I can't remember in this article, but remember, melatonin is orally active. So sometimes people feed sheep melatonin, and that's telling them the nights are getting longer or the days are getting shorter. And sometimes when you feed melatonin, it's used to then start ester cycles in sheep because they're obviously seasonal. Yeah, whoever did that, I mean, if you can draw that, that's pretty neat. That you know what you're talking about. I mean, it was in that article. Yeah, very good. Like really yeah, helpful. excellent. Okay, super. Kirsten, <coughs> am I saying that right? Yep. Okay. And uh, what did you have? <coughs> um, I had a um, Did you have? Did you send me something? Yeah. Okay. Is it? Um, is it? No, it's not that one. Yeah, let's see. Do you see yours? Is it this one right here? 
I think that's my two ideas. No? no? Okay, so maybe I'll just show the article on that. I do that. Okay, let's do that. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I must have goofed. Okay. All right, so my article was kind of um, going off of Joe's. Um, so they basically were doing a study to see if they could um, cause the sheep to go into estrus in the long period. Um, so um, essentially they were trying to see if melatonin combined with progesterone could increase the chance of pregnancy in the anestrous use. So um, they did, I think it was 69 um, sheep, and they were treated sub-Q with a silicone melatonin implant. Um, and there were four different concentrations of the implant. There was 500, uh, 250, 125, and then a non-treated control group. Okay, now let me stop there. So here's another way you can administer melatonin. I don't know if you've ever seen these. I could bring one. It's like a little implant that's like a little tube of celastic tubing. And then what you can do is you can put melatonin in it. You can actually make these homemade, although I think a company makes them. Mm -hmm. And then you implant it subcutaneously with a like a little, think of it as like a, a big bore needle. Like you guys don't usually see 12 gauge needles, but you, let's say you have a 12 gauge needle and you stick it subcutaneously and then that little tube you can place subcutaneously and you pull the needle out and then the implant is left under the skin and it will slowly absorb the melatonin. That's what they did. So that's another way to administer melatonin. And then, um, so then they implanted a P4 implant, which basically just synchronized all the use. Uh, this was placed 12 days before the breeding season. And then rams were introduced to the four treatment groups. And then after 45 days, a serum progesterone level um, in all of the use was, was, was assessed. Um, overall, it was found that the 500 milligram treatment had a higher pregnancy rate than the control group. Um, the other two in the middle wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of change that was um, relevant. Uh, but this determines that if you combine the melatonin and progesterone into the U, it can be used to attain a pregnancy in an anesterous U. It was also found that the lambing in the control group took 10 days longer than in the other groups that were um, introduced with this melatonin and progesterone implant. Um, and from this whole study, they found that these implants were effective in inducing the pregnancy in otherwise anesthesia use. Okay, so they used a progesterone implant. It was so, like combined. They were like, they used the melatonin implant with the progesterone, so it wasn't just melatonin by itself. Right, and so I, I think it was a separate implant, probably, uh, if I, I remember right. Probably. It might have been, I don't remember. So here's, you know, so progesterone is a steroid, but that's another way to administer steroids. You can put the steroid in this elastic tubing um, and put it subcutaneously. Now the thing is, these were anesterous at the beginning. And here's a little kicker, and this works for most animals. Let's say you have some animals that are anesterous and you want them to come into heat. If you give them a, just a plain progesterone implant and let it sit there for a while, you know, a, a progesterone implant is like an artificial corpus luteum. Think of it that way, right? A corpus luteum gives the animal progesterone. So you give progesterone, and for some reason, think of it as damming up hormones coming from the uh, anterior pituitary. You're like, you're going to stop FSH and LH secretion. Then you leave it in probably at least seven days, maybe 14. And then you pull the implant out, the progesterone. And when you take the implant out, blood levels of progesterone go like this, drop. And that's like kick-starting estrous cycles. You'll get like the synchrony of estrous cycles when you pull the progesterone implant out. It's like uh, the dam breaks. And then the pituitary gland is able to release more FSH and, and LH than it would have. And so that's what they did. Now if you read this article, I was a little not dismayed, but there's some typos in here. I don't know if you saw that. I was reading it last night, and it's like, okay, you guys didn't proofread very well. I mean, I'm not a stickler, but it's like, you know, there are some typos. I can't remember where they were, but um, 
overall it was pretty good. Anybody have any questions on that? Um, so for the, when it blocks, like the progesterone, when it's blocking the FSH and LH, does that, it doesn't make it go away that you still get an FSH and LH surge to start. Well, when, once you have progesterone in, the animal thinks, like, in a sense, think of it as, I'm pregnant, I'm not going to do the LH. Right. And if so it, then you pull the implant and then you get the surge. Is it new LH and FSH or is it that block stuff that just well, stuck around? Well, it's, until it's until basically it. what's been stored in. Okay. Yeah, I got you down. But think of it as you pull the implant and you've dammed up hormones and when you pull the implant, the dam breaks. And if you have some animals like, let's say, I have a bunch of animals that have never reached puberty and it's like way past their time. If you gave them progesterone, sometimes when you pull it, you'll induce puberty. It's amazing. And in this case, it's Ann Esther's sheep. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so I sent you an email. Ethan and I worked on a quiz. It was like pulling teeth, giving some of those answers. Oh my gosh. Uh, we're done. Where's Nugget? Is Nugget safe? Okay, Nugget is safe. Now, Nugget will be back for the test. If you don't have any other Kirsten, thanks a lot. If you don't have any other questions, you are free to go. See you Wednesday, G126. Okay, you too.